Good afternoon, friends, JASA members, uh, Netsuki lovers. The Japanese Art Society of America has a mission to promote the study and appreciation of Japanese arts and culture. We accomplish this by publishing a peer-reviewed scholarly annual journal called Impressions and by scheduling lectures on Japanese art as well as trips to museums and private collections. In this time of sheltering, of course, we can't do those in-person trips. So we are pleased at JASA to offer this series of virtual programs. As a board member of both the Japanese uh, Art Society of America and the International Netsuki Society, I am delighted to introduce Marcia Vargas Hanley, president of the INS. She will be introducing today's speaker, Dr. David Batsumio. Uh, take it away, Marcia. Sorry, it appeared I got muted. So I'm Marcia Vargas Hanley, president of the International Netsuke Society. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here today co-sponsoring this talk by Dr. David Putsumia on the Year of the Ox. The International Netsuke Society is a US nonprofit charity that was established in 1979 for the purpose of studying Netsuke and related objects, the carvers or artists that created them and the culture that they evolved from. And in order to accomplish these goals, we publish a 60 page quarterly journal. Uh, you're seeing on the screen, the cover of our last winter journal, which is again, celebrating our current year of the ox. And we also hold biannual conventions, have a website and a forum that you can visit to learn more about the society. The International Society has approximately 450 members currently located in 21 different countries. We also have some local chapters that hold meetings and those we have in the US, one in New York, Washington DC, on the West Coast, we have Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, we have a chapter in Australia. We have a chapter in Tokyo, our Tokyo chapter, uh, Moscow. And for our European members and the UK, we have a chapter located in the UK that goes under Netsky, Euro Netsky. So that is what makes up our organization. And um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. David Butsamia, who is a member of our society, is a collector of Netsuke and related items, and is a retired endodontist from Los, uh, Long Beach, California. Also, uh, David, we're very fortunate after he did retire uh, in 2018, David has become much Act very active in our society, writing articles for the journal, also giving some talks and lectures to our local West Coast chapters and at our last biannual convention that was in Paris in late October, 2019. So I can only hope that David also is working on something for our next biannual convention which will be in Amsterdam and is going to be in May of 2022. So David, we're looking forward to your talk and I'll turn this over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia and Sue. I'd also like to thank the program committee of Allison, Amy, Helen, and Victoria for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'd like to wish everyone a happy year of the ox, and I hope that everyone has been able to cope with the pandemic as well. 
If the pandemic does come under control this year, it would be fitting because the ops was thought to have properties which would help protect one's health. Today, I'd like to introduce the subject of Netsuke and Sagimono, and then in uh, recognition of the year of the ox, to show how the ox uh, fit into Japanese society, and I'll use Netsuke and Sagimono uh, as illustrations. Now, some of you may not be familiar with what Netsuke and Sagimono are, and that would not be surprising because even in their country of origin, they are little known today. They began as small utilitarian objects which were worn in ensembles throughout the Edo period by all classes of people on a daily basis. Yet despite the fact that they were in use for over three centuries, they fell out of use uh, within just a few generations of time during the Meiji era. And there were two uh, reasons for that. One is that during the Meiji era, the government was making a big push for Japan to become modernized and many people looked upon Netsuke and Sagimono as old fashioned. The other reason is that uh, during the Meiji era, Western dress was introduced to Japan and with that came pockets and pockets made Netsuke and Sagimono redundant or even obsolete. Netsuke and Sagimono evolved because of the fact that traditional Japanese clothing lacked pockets and so uh, some people might carry small items just tucked into their clothing, but most small items couldn't be carried conveniently or safely in that way. And so there evolved a number of small personal containers uh, to carry specific types of small objects. And in general, these uh, small containers were referred to as sagimono. And that translates as a hanging thing because these were hung uh, from the obi. So while other countries also um, sometimes wore objects dangling from their belts. Uh, for instance, in Mongolia and Hungary, uh, Japanese uh, Sagamono Netsuke actually became quite refined uh, and of a scope that uh, they were uniquely Japanese. And uh, while other countries and uh, cultures uh, wore uh, jewelry, in Japan they did not, but the Netsuke and Sagamono ensemble sort of fulfilled that role. And by the mid 18th century, they actually became worn by many people more as fashion statements rather than uh, as utilitarian objects as they originally evolved from. So a picture is worth a thousand words. If we look at the photo to the right, we see a photo of someone wearing traditional Japanese dress. And you'll see the obi around their waist and hanging beneath the obi is a rectangular object. So this particular type of sagimono is known as an indro which for the most part was used to carry medications. The indro is uh, supported by a cord which runs underneath the obi and then is attached to the back of the round object sitting at the upper edge of the obi. So that is the netsuke. So the netsuke evolved to support the obi and help keep it, or rather support the sagimono and help keep it support, uh, supported and uh, secured to the wearer. Now, I only have time to introduce two types of sagimono, so I'll show ones that are the most popularly collected today. So this is an example of an indro ensemble. Indro translates as seal case or seal basket. So the earliest indro were hard containers which carried seals and ink. Seals were important to authenticate the authority of someone signing a document. And in fact, in some Asian countries today, the seal is actually still considered more important than the signature. However, there was a parallel development for the indro to carry medications. And that's a purpose which became much more popular and lasted longer than its use as a seal case. So here we see photos of the front and the back of an indro. That's the larger object. Um, and to fill out the ensemble, we have a small green bead at the top. So that is known as an ojime. So you notice that there are cords running up the sides of the indro uh, to hold the compartments together. And then the cord passes through a channel in the center of the ojime. And then the cord continues to uh, the netsuke, which is the rectangular object to the right. So the object to the right would sit at the top of the obi and help keep the indro suspended and secured to the wearer. Now to the left, we see the indro in the uh, closed position. To the right, we see how it's constructed. 
So the Indra consisted of multiple stacked uh, vertical compartments, each of which were capable of carrying a different type of a medication. So with the uh, Ojimea down close to the Indra, it helped keep things close together. By sliding the uh, Ojimea upwards, the bead upwards, it helped loosen the cord and then it allowed people uh, access to the compartments. So that here on the right, we can see that they're separated. The one in the center has been tilted toward us at about a 45 degree angle so that you can see inside of one of the compartments. You'll also notice that all of the surfaces have been beautifully decorated in lacquer. So even the surfaces that would not normally be viewed by someone when the uh, indro is closed has still been treated with a great amount of detail. And that's something which is characteristic of Indro and Sagimono in general. Uh, this is a second type of a uh, Indro, uh, I'm sorry, Sagimono ensemble. So this is a smoking set. So if you look at the photograph to the far left, you'll see at the left edge is a, a replica of an antique Japanese pipe. The Japanese pipes were quite slender and the bowls were tiny compared to Western pipes. The bowls were actually not much larger than a thimble. Just to the right of the uh, pipe is a case made of sandalwood and it's uh, incised with a depiction of a uh, hote at the bottom. So if one were to take their pipe outside and uh, they would want to carry it either in a sheath or a hard case such as this to help protect it. Now you'll notice to the immediate right of the pipe case is an orange bead. So that's the ojime, it's made out of coral. And there's a short segment of cord passing from the pipe case through the ojime to a pouch. So the pouch is made out of deer skin and the pouch would carry the tobacco for the pipe. In the center photo, we see the pipe case disassembled. So this particular pipe case consists of two parts. So the upper part is sort of a, a sleeve that could be inserted into the lower half. So by removing it, you can insert the pipe into the pipe case, and then the upper part can be um, inserted back over it to cap it off and protect it. To the lower right, we see an enlargement of the clasp on the uh, flap of the pouch. So this particular piece of metalwork would have been done by a different artist than the person who carved the pipe. It would have been made by a skilled metal worker who was primarily employed by the samurai during the Edo period. So these metal workers would have been making sword fittings and armor for the warrior class. Because the Edo period was a relatively peaceful period, they did have some opportunities to collaborate with Sagimono and Netsuke artists to produce inlays, or in this case, the clasp for this pouch. So some of you who collect the sword fittings or sword furniture might recognize this type of an object. It's similar in shape and size to a manuki, and in fact may have been a manuki repurposed to be used as a um, class for this pouch. Now the term or word netsuke may be a contraction of the phrase nenitsuku, which means attached to the end. An earlier translation interpreted the meaning as attached to a root, which led to the theory that many of the earliest netsuke may have been simply found objects from nature, such as a tiny seashell or a small gourd, which were used to suspend sagimono from the yobi. We're pretty certain that by the mid to late uh, 16th century, however, that most netsuke were actually man-made objects being made specifically to suspend uh, sagimono from the obi. Netsuke are characterized by having many different forms. When the, the word netsuke is mentioned, most people think of a small sculptural object, like maybe a miniature okimono, but there are other forms as well, and I'll try to introduce some of those during the uh, talk. They were made from a wide variety of materials, and they also have a wide range of subject matter, ranging from everything from items that were used in everyday life to things from nature and also figures from history and religion and from folklore. So that by studying the subject matter of Netsuke and Sagimono, you can learn a lot about Japanese culture from them. And that's been a big bonus for me. I'm actually of Japanese descent. So for me, it's been a fun and interesting way to kind of learn a little bit about my roots. <clears throat> 
And again, they evolved from being very simple items to very refined items by the uh, mid 18th century. And again, many people wore them as fashion items and forms of self-expression, as well as uh, for being utilitarian objects. We're certain that they were well in use by the beginning of the 17th century based on paintings such as this one. This was made circa 1600. And if you look closely at the right hip of the people in this picture, they're all wearing sagimono. This is a further enlargement of uh, someone from that era. So we see that above the obi, we see kind of a round off-white object. So that is the netsuke. You can see underneath the obi are two cords. One is uh, going to a round object, which is a pouch. The other one is going to a rectangular object, which is an inro. And we see to the right a photograph of an actual netsuke that was made in the mid 19th century. So you see the one on the right is in the same form as the one in the picture on the left. So this form has persisted at that point up to 250 years. And the reason that that happened was that this form is probably as good as you can get for the netsuke to be functional. Because the netsuke was worn very closely to your body, you wanted to have uh, rounded and smooth contours for it to be comfortable. You didn't want it to have any sharp edges, which might rub against and fray your clothing. And you certainly didn't want to have any pointy protuberances that might poke you or even get broken off during use. This uh, form of netsuke is known as a manju netsuke. And that's named after a popular Japanese confection, which has a similar form that is a thick disc. I'd like to briefly discuss the Asian zodiac system just to show how the ox fits into it. The zodiac system is a very complicated one and it probably originated in China some three to 4,000 years ago. It has 12 branches, which each branch consists of uh, representing a year in a 12 year cycle. There are also 10 stems. These are the yin and the yang versions of the five elements. Each of the 12 branches is paired with five stems so that a complete zodiac cycle lasts 60 years, not just 12 years. The system also takes into account compass directions, personality traits, and colors. During the Han Dynasty, the Chinese assigned an animal to represent each branch to make it easier for people to learn and to remember the system. Around 600 AD, the Japanese adopted the system and they refer to these animals as the Junishi. Juni is the number 12, and Shi is a reference to them being branches. Now, while many people use the zodiac system, much as people in the West use a horoscope, that is, they used to consult it before making important decisions, the real reason it developed and the most uh, important use of it was that it helped people to manage and record time. So the ox represents the hours from 1 to 3 a.m. It represents certain days of the month. It represents the 12th month of the year and also the second year in a 12-year cycle. Now to the right, we see a photograph of a netsuke, which is what most people think of when the word netsuke is brought up, more of a sculptural object, uh, sort of like a, a miniature okimono. But again, um, because of its use, being worn very closely to a person's body, there were certain design restrictions that a good netsuke would have to conform to in order to be successful. So although this looks like a small sculpture, you notice that the horns, the legs, and the tails of these animals, they're all kind of tucked in. So it makes the overall composition more compact and rounded. Uh, despite that, they're easily recognizable as a, a cow and a calf, and you can see a great amount of detail went into the carving. Notice the inlaid eyes, and uh, you can see even the fur is uh, depicted by all the fine in, uh, incisions on the, um, the hides of the animal. So all of these are aspects which make this a really wonderful netsuke. There's even a sense of movement imparted by the uh, calf clambering over the mother's back. Now, people often wonder how the ox was chosen to be one of the 12 zodiac animals and how it achieved a second position in the cycle. Uh, 
Historically, uh, six of the 12 zodiac animals had been domesticated in China at the time that animals were associated or assigned to represent the branches of the zodiac. So these uh, six animals were very important to the Chinese agrarian society. So that's probably the reason those were chosen. The remaining six were probably chosen because of their symbolism. Now, a more entertaining way to describe how they were chosen rests in a number of different legends associated with the uh, zodiac animals. So I'll just briefly go over one version, and that involves the Jade Emperor of China. Thousands of years ago, the Jade Emperor of China issued a proclamation to the animal kingdom, and he invited them to come greet him on the coming New Year's Day. And he promised them that the first 12 to arrive and greet him in that order would be honored by uh, being named as representatives of the 12 branches of the zodiac. So the ox was a very slow moving animal and decided that it needed to start out early on its journey to the palace in order to have any chance of becoming one of the first 12 to see the emperor. So the ox started off uh, on New Year's Eve. Now the rat was a very opportunistic and cunning animal and he noticed the rat leave, I mean the ox leaving. And so the rat decided to try to take advantage of the situation. So the rat snuck up behind the ox and unbeknownst to the ox, he jumped onto the ox's back and he rode the ox to just before the gates of the palace. Whereupon the rat jumped off and screwed in front of the ox to claim first place in line. The ox did come in second, however, and the remaining 10 animals followed in suit. Now below we see a photograph of the front and the back of another wonderfully done uh, Netsuke. So this particular type is similar to a Manju in form, but because it's carved in open work, this is referred to as a Ryusa style Netsuke. And you can see that a great amount of thought had to go into this design because all 12 of the Zodiac animals had been harmoniously uh, put into this piece. To the right, we see the back of the Netsuke. We know that that's the back surface because of the two channels or holes in the center. So those are for the uh, cord to pass through. The other end of the cord would be attached to the sagimono that it supports. But despite the fact that that surface would be hidden from view most of the time while it's being worn, you can see that it's still uh, carved beautifully with a great amount of detail. And if you look on the left photo, just above center, you notice the rat. And notice that it has been cleverly placed on the back of the ox in reference to the legend that I just described. Now for practical purposes, the ox had several uses uh, in Japanese culture uh, before the Meiji period. So one, it was used as a riding animal. Although horses were also in Japan, uh, the warrior class regarded them as too valuable for their use in warfare for them to be allowed to be used by the common people. So most common people had to be content with using an ox or possibly a mule as a riding animal. So here we see a beautifully done uh, inro where the background lacquer is in polished gold. But we see that the imagery is done by uh, inlays of pewter for the ox and inlays of mother of pearl for the writer. Now, although this was uh, made in the 19th century, this is a revival of a style known as the Rimpa style, which is popularized in the 17th century by the artists Honami Koetz and Ogata Korin. The ox was also used as a beast of burden. So here we see an image of an ox, uh, which is laden with brushwood. Now notice that this inro has been decorated in an entirely different way than the previous one. So instead of a bright gold uh, lacquer background, this one has a very dark lacquer background. And this one relies on carving for the imagery rather than inlays of uh, pewter and mother of pearl. So this style uh, where you have the uh, carved lacquer is not a commonly seen technique, but when, um, when it's seen, it was normally done by the Kanshosai group. And this is an example of their work from the 19th century. The ox was also used as a draft animal. Uh, wheeled vehicles drawn by animals were not 
uh, commonly used in Japan because of the fact that it's such a mountainous country, the terrain really isn't conducive for vehicles such as that. But they did evolve an ox-drawn carriage known as a Gosho Gudama or a Gisha. And their use was restricted to the nobility and was particularly popular during the Heian period. Here we see uh, another Indro with a, a dark uh, lacquer background. And we see a beautifully done image of an ox-drawn carriage. Uh, this is done in lacquer, primarily gold lacquer. So again, a different technique in decorating the Indro uh, compared to the previous two examples. Now, the most famous event involving an ox-drawn carriage involved a nobleman named Sugawara no Michizane. Michizane was a member of the imperial court in Kyoto during the Heian period, but he was falsely accused of uh, conspiring against an incoming emperor. And because of that, the new emperor banished him to Kyushu, and there Michizane died of uh, grief while in exile. Michizane's body was to be brought back to Kyoto for burial. However, the great white ox that was drawing the carriage bearing his body suddenly stopped in the middle of the road, laid down, and would not move any further. Legend says that the animal actually died of sorrow for Michizane. The attendants had no recourse but to bury Michizane nearby, and a small shrine was erected in his honor. Now, legend further has it that Michizane's spirit became vengeful and he unleashed a, a barrage of thunder against the emperor's palace to the extent that the emperor not only posthumously pardoned Michizane, but he also elevated him and he granted him the name Tenjin. As Tenjin, he became known as the patron of literature or alternatively the patron of calligraphy or of learning. To the right, we see a portrayal of Tenjin in the form of a mask. So this is actually a Netsuke. There's a subset of Netsuke known as mass Netsuke, which are miniature reproductions of masks that were popularly used during Japanese theater, such as uh, no Ugaku or Kyogen plays. So this is a mask to the right is made of wood that has been beautifully lacquered and represents uh, Tenjin. Now, after Michizane was elevated to Tenjin, a cult following sprang up around Japan and a number of other Tenjin shrines were built as well. This is a photo of Hofu Tenmangu Jinja, which is the first of what are considered the three of the greatest Michizane shrines or Tenjin shrines. Uh, if you look uh, toward the center, just to the right in the foreground, just to the right of the steps to the entrance, we see a large statue of a recumbent ox. So this is a feature which is common to all of the Tenjin shrines. And these uh, statues of ox have been venerated over the centuries. The ox was also used as uh, an animal to plow fields. And because of this, the ox became associated with the spring season and also became symbolic of a good harvest. The ox uh, also became symbolic with good health as well. People would often wear uh, ox netsuke as an amulet to ward off disease. And in Taoist medicine, the uh, bones of oxen were ground up and sometimes put into elixirs. And the shavings of ox horn were sometimes consumed as a remedy against baldness and fever and headache. The ox was also associated with good fortune. Uh, there's an alcove in many Japanese homes known as the tokonoma. And at the tokonoma, some people would keep a small stone sculpture of an ox. And this was known as a nadayushi, which translates as stroking ox. So if the owner wanted to have a wish granted, he would carefully pick up his nadayushi, stroke it, and make his wish. And if the wish were granted, the little nadayushi would be rewarded by having a tiny cushion placed under it. There is also the expression ushi no neta hodo, which means to the extent of a, a recumbent ox. And this implies a great deal of something, particularly of money. So it would be common for merchants to keep uh, statues of recumbent oxen in their shops with the hopes of bringing in more commerce.
To the right, we see a photograph of another type of uh, Netsuke, again, similar to a manju in that it's a uh, sort of a thick disc shape, but the center is actually a metal plate which has been fitted uh, to the inside of the um, outside ivory bowl. So this type of uh, Netsuke is referred to as a Kagami Buta Netsuke. Kagami Buta means uh, mirrored lid. And that is a reference to the fact that the uh, ancient mirrors were actually round discs of highly polished metal. And you notice the imagery on the disc. Uh, we see an ox, but as if the ox was not enough to bring good uh, fortune, we see that the writer is Daikoku, who is one of the seven lucky gods. Now the ox typically had a stoic and kind of a passive peaceful demeanor. And uh, a lot of people thought that it resembled a meditative state. And that led it to becoming included in some Zen Buddhist parables um, about uh, the steps needed to attain enlightenment. So one of these parables is known as the 10 ox herding pictures. This originated in China around the 12th century and then eventually made its way to Japan. So the 10 ox herding pictures illustrate each of the 10 steps needed that one needs to take in order to attain enlightenment in Zen Buddhism. And there are two principal characters in these pictures. One is the ox herd, who is a person trying to attain enlightenment. And then the ox represents his enlightened mind. Now in the first three pictures, there's actually a little interaction between the two because the ox has wandered off and the ox herd is now in search of his missing ox. It's not until stages three, four, and five that there's some interaction. And so these are the stages that are most commonly portrayed in Japanese art and in Netsuke and Sagimono as well. So here we see an Indro portraying uh, stage four, where the ox herd is actually caught up to his ox, but is having difficulty gaining control of the ox. This beautifully done uh, Indro uh, is done in lacquer and is signed Shio Miwasanari, who was an excellent uh, lacquer master from the 17th century. Some of you who collect paintings may recognize him also as a Tosa's trained uh, painter. This is another Indro, uh, beautifully decorated in lacquer, and it depicts the fifth stage of the 10 oxherding pictures. So you notice now that the oxherd is starting to gain control of the ox. He's uh, beginning to be able to lead the ox. And this Manju Netsuke uh, portrays stage six. So at this stage, the ox herd is now um, not only able to control the ox, he's able to ride the ox without even using his hands to control the ox with the rope halter. And he's now um, often joyfully playing his flute to celebrating this uh, accomplishment. And this is another beautifully done Indro in lacquer sign Shomi Masanari. Here uh, is a depiction of probably stage six or later, because we see that despite the fact that the ox herd is asleep and the ox is awake, the ox is not making any attempt to run away from him as it did at the beginning of the, uh, the parable. So here we see that the two are in, uh, at peace with each other, they're in harmony and their minds are as one. And so they are now well on their way to the road to enlightenment. So stages seven through 10 of the 10 oxherding pictures uh, refer to what is known as the journey home, which is uh, a, a representation of actually going to Nirvana and then attaining Buddhahood. Now ox imagery was not only associated with Zen Buddhism, it was associated with Taoism as well. This is a Netsuke of which a number of different, uh, very similar models have been carved. And the writer that's being portrayed is a man named Roshi. Roshi is the Japanese name of the man who uh, invented or uh, founded Taoism. So legend has it that Roshi, after writing the Tao Te Ching, which is the foundation of Taoism, uh, more or less climbed aboard his ox and rode off into the sunset. He was basically riding off west to the land of the immortals. Now, this is a very similar Netsuke in composition 
although uh, some of you may recognize that the writer is someone um, known as Ote. Ote is very popularly known as one of the seven lucky gods. So here we see a substitution of Hote for Roshi. So some might uh, interpret this as a mitate. Mitate is a concept in Japanese art where you take something that's classic or well-known, but you change it slightly to make it uh, the new version, an allusion to the original, or maybe even a parody of the original. So some people might look at this and interpret uh, this Netsuke as Hote being uh, a mitate of Roshi or a pun of him. However, when one considers the fact that Hote had his origins as a Zen Buddhist priest in China named Budai, that lends a whole nother level of nuance to this. So that this might also be interpreted as uh, Hote replacing the ox herd in one of the 10 ox herding pictures at a stage where they're well on their way to enlightenment. Shibata Zeshin is a name which is familiar to many people who collect art. People who collect lacquer consider him uh, one of the greatest of the lacquer masters of the 19th century in Japan, while other people also recognize him as a great painter. So Zeshin was an artist who kind of crossed over into different genres. And in fact, uh, the photo on the left shows a painting that Zeshin did in lacquer. So that's a very difficult technique uh, some people attribute it, uh, the development of that technique to Zeshin uh, because lacquer is a much more viscous material than uh, paint and is much more difficult to work with. On the right, we see an example of Zeshin's more traditional type of lacquer where uh, it's imagery on an inro. And it's kind of a curious image. We see an ox which appears to be prancing or bucking or running. And we also see something kind of entangled in the ox's horns. Now, I'm afraid I don't have an image of the obverse of the Netsuke, but it was described as an old farmer's wife chasing after the ox, trying to retrieve a bolt of cloth that became entwined around the ox's horns. So this is an example of Zeshin's sometimes um, way of putting in a little bit of humor into his work. Now, Zeshin was not the only artist to kind of cross over into different genres. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Shiomi Masanari was a Tosa, excuse me, a Tosa trained painter, as was Ogawa Haritsu, who was a great lacquerer and uh, maker of sagimono and netsuke. He was also uh, a tea master, a poet, and uh, was also trained in the Tosa school. Ogata Korin and Tsuchida Soets were both lacquerers and produced uh, Netsuke and Sagemono, but they were trained in the Kano school of painting. And one of the earliest known uh, Netsuke carvers was a painter named Yoshimura Shuzan, who would make Netsuke for fun as a hobby, but would give them to his friends and relatives afterwards. The ox was not only a source of subject matter for Netsuke, it was also a source of material. Now, ox horn was often used, uh, but usually small bits of it uh, for inlays for the eyes of animals or for people. Uh, in this case, we see a Netsuke in which the entire Netsuke has been made of ox horn. So it's an interesting subject. This is known as a shiozake, which is a dried salted salmon. So during the Edo period, people would sometimes clean salmon, salt them, and then hang them out in the cold air to dry to create salmon jerky, basically as a way of preserving the food uh, to be consumed later. So this is a very realistic uh, rendition of a dried salted salmon. Uh, this was a subject which was done uh, fairly commonly in Netsuke, but the ones done by Kano Tessai and his followers, such as this one, were pretty distinctive because uh, they made them out of horn and they made them with a great amount of detail. If you look closely, you can see that there are literally thousands of individual scales which have been carved on this piece. And because this piece has kind of a elongated form, this uh, type of netsuke is known as a sashi type of netsuke. Uh, 
Well, if any of you have had your interest peaked and want to learn more about Netsuke, I would encourage you to visit our website at the International Netsuke Society, www.netsuke.org. Again, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to the study and appreciation of Netsuke and Sagimono. Some of the benefits of being a member are receiving a quarterly journal. We have uh, an international conference every other year. We also have regional chapters, which have local meetings, and those are great ways to maybe get introduced to the subject. You don't have to be a member in order to attend the meeting. So if you find out about one, um, you're welcome to join and uh, just to see what some of our membership is about. We often bring uh, pieces to share with each other. Let's get Sagimono. So that's a great opportunity to see and handle actual pieces. We also have an internet forum in which people can answer or ask questions rather and discuss Netsuke and Sagimono. We also have uh, a list of publications, which are good resources for learning about them. We have lists of museums in which you can go and see exhibitions of uh, Netsuke and Sagimono. And we also have lists of um, dealers who have been vetted and who we consider to be um, ones that we can trust in, in gaining these. Uh, these items. If you were to just simply Google the word Netsuke, you will probably be led to a number of websites which are trying to sell you uh, modern mass produced carvings which are being misrepresented as being uh, antique or uh, pieces of art. Uh, so if you wanted to learn more about it, I would encourage you to visit the, our uh, website www.netsuke.org. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll try to handle them now. David, thank you so much. I am going to let you draw a breath for a moment. And I just want <laughs> to share with our JASA members that um, many of whom have already received part one of this year's volume of impressions number 42 that uh, coming later this fall, part two will include an essay on Netsuke written some 30 years ago by Raymond Bouchel, who donated his fabulous Netsuke collection to LACMA. So you can look forward to that in a few months. And um, so David, we do have, as we promised you, our members always have lots of questions. And the first question is from a member in the audience who asks, there must be so much knowledge needed to evaluate Netsuke, the aesthetics, the workmanship, the appreciation of the subject matter, but how do you identify signatures and how you mentioned mass produced, how do you authenticate Netsuke? That's a good and a very difficult question to answer. So um, basically regarding signatures, it was commonplace for a person to learn to carve Netsuke by becoming an apprentice of a master. And while working for that master, he might be allowed to affix um, the master's signature onto the carving, even though the pupil carved it. Uh, and that would be with the master's sanction. Uh, so sometimes there are pieces that have been, have signatures that are legitimately placed there with the um, consent of the master, but not actually made by him. And then of course there are pieces that are more or less, uh, the signatures have been added after the fact just to try to um, maybe enhance the value or, or give the impression that it was made by you know another carver. So that's a difficult question. Basically, we do have indexes. We have some um, sources where you can look at examples of some of the signatures. But really, the um, it's very difficult to authenticate a signature because most of the carvers were not, um, they were mostly common people and they were not considered um, important enough to have their, their histories recorded and examples of their signatures made. And so we know very little about the, them and also the signatures themselves. But basically by studying the pieces, some people feel like they can maybe authenticate the signature and tell one from an original master versus some of his pupils or some 
where the signature has been affixed later. But uh, really, it's just um, an educated guess as to whether it's authentic or not. I think basically what you really have to do is look at the carving itself or the, the work itself. If it's a very high quality, I think that's the biggest thing you should look at on a piece rather than to um, look at the signature on it. Um, Agasari Shanmugalingam asks, he has actually two questions. Um, how does Ivory Netscape fare in the art marketplace in light of the ivory trade ban? Right now, um, most of the world, it's uh, difficult to acquire ivory pieces legally. I think in Europe, it's still legal to sell ivory pieces, uh, but most of the other parts of the world, um, it's not. So uh, acquiring ivory pieces can be a tricky thing at this point. If they're already um, in a country and then it's okay to own them, whether or not you can legally sell them, that depends on you know each area, jurisdiction or country. And then his, his second question was, in Ivory Netske, how do you make the stains? What material is used? That, well, I've, I, I'm not, I've never partaken in actually making one, but I think I know that I've read that sometimes they would be placed in tea or other types of stains, but I'm not really qualified to answer that question, I think. Um, Helen Rinsberg would like to know, where is the Tenjin shrine that you showed? It's in Yamaguchi Prefecture. And Terry Quist asks, have you noticed slowly increasing awareness of Netsuke with the publication of Edmund Duval's book, The Hair with the Amber Eyes, and then the Japan Society exhibit in Washington, D.C. in 2017? That's hard to say. Um, certainly that book I think opened up a lot of eyes or brought in, made it uh, more public to a, a wider range of people. Um, as far as how many more people are actually collecting or, or actively seeking knowledge about it, that I, I couldn't speak to though. Um, going back to when you were talking about signatures, where on Netsuke were signatures usually placed or was there no particular place? That's a good question. Um, so with the figural Netsuke, a lot of times they were placed maybe on the bottom, um, on the um, Manju style or the rounded styles, they could be the, either on the front or the bottom. The Kagami Buta ones where they have a, a metal plate that would have been on the plate, at, at least for the metal worker because there would have been uh, another place to put it unless it was on the underside. But typically they would sign it um, on the front in that type of Netsuke. But many of them were placed in areas where it was not easily seen because they didn't want to take away from the overall, you know, form of the work. But I should also mention that uh, maybe the majority of Netsuke were actually unsigned. So the earliest uh, people who made them, again, they were common people. If they were making them on commission for someone of a higher uh, class, it might have um, seemed to uh, rude for them to place their name on something that they were making for someone of a higher stature. And early on, uh, they were not considered art either. So they wouldn't have even thought of signing their name to something like that. How expensive were Netsuke during the Edo period? Were they worn by most sections of society or only by the more privileged strata? They were actually worn by all classes. So I guess you could make an analogy with wristwatches. So you could buy an inexpensive functional wristwatch like a Casio, and that would have been within the range of somebody in the common class in the Edo period. But of course, if you were a wealthy merchant or a noble person or a samurai with more means, then you could go for the ones that might be considered fine art. Uh, so um, they range from, I, we know that one of the later um, Carver's uh, Matsusugu Kaigyoku side, there's some um, letters that were found in which we could see what he was charging for some of his works. And they would have been the equivalent of the price of a home for a common person. But then again, there were other pieces that could have been acquired much um, 
for much less. If people had to, they could probably even make their own. So again, some of the earliest ones were found objects, maybe a cowrie shell or a, a tiny gourd, something like that. Um, the salted fish netsuke that you showed had sharp edges. Was it made primarily for show or to wear? That's an interesting question. Many, we think that maybe in the late 19th century, many of them may have been worn or used rather more for show than for actual use. So some of them may have maybe remained on shelves in the tokonoma. Um, the one that uh, I showed though, that one, that one would have rested um, vertically lengthwise on the obi and because it's flat, that actually may not have mm -hmm. caused that much damage to the clothing. So that one would still possibly be a functional net scare. Um, we had an earlier question from um, an attendee who asked if women carried indo for their smoking material, for their yeah, indro were mainly for medications, but there were pipe cases and pouches for smoking. Um, so that's, there's some debate on that. So with the indro, it's thought for the most part that those were only worn by men, but women could also wear other types of sagamono. So they could have worn pouches. Um, they probably wore pipe cases and um, tobacco pouches, but I don't know for certain. I haven't really studied that aspect of it. We have a couple more general questions and then I'm going to focus on you as a collector. Um, the first question is, what is the material of coloring ivory? Is it semi-clear lacquer? What about the thin black lines? The thin black lines, I think were probably, well, again, I, I don't know for certain. Um, I've read some descriptions where it's maybe ink that was used to stain the fine lines. As far as applying um, lacquer, clear lacquer to ivory, I don't know that that was that commonly done. A lot of times the ivory takes on its own patina over time, so it looks kind of shiny. Uh, but I don't know that a lot of them were actually coated with lacquer. A well-known artist like Shibata Zeshin would be the designer of the Netsuke and commission the carving from a carving master. Is that true? Are there any drawings of Netsuke designs from well-known designers still extant? Um, so for the first part, actually Zeshin did make Netsuke or he, he would lacquer Netsuke. So maybe the Netsuke itself might've been fashioned by a carver and then he would apply the lacquer. So I'm not sure if I answered that first question. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second question? Are there any drawings um, extant? Of Netsuke designs? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, so I've never carved, but I think what most carvers would do is maybe make a sketch of uh, you know what they were planning to make and maybe even transfer some of that onto the piece of wood or whatever material they were carving and then use that as a guide in refining the carving. As far as Indro designs, uh, there were definitely um, design books. So uh, some of the lacquer masters would actually take a sheet of paper and design exactly how they would want to put the uh, imagery on. And this would actually be the exact size and shape of the Indro because from that, uh, that person, if they wanted to repeat the design or if one of their students wanted to repeat the design, they could take a special paper, transfer it over like a stencil and then apply that to the actual um, form of the indro to give the outlines of the image that was going to be applied in lacquer. So some okay. of these design books have actually been preserved and uh, some people collect those. Thank you. I think we're all curious since both of our organizations are organizations of collectors. How did you start collecting? Um, I was actually attending an endodontic conference in Honolulu and I would pass this antique shop going from my hotel to the convention center every day. And 
one afternoon, um, I decided to just go in and take a look. And that's where I saw the first Netsuke that I could actually purchase. And that's where I bought my first one. And I was aware of what it was when I bought it, but I didn't know a lot about them. Uh, often people ask me, how did I learn about them? And I probably saw some at a museum exhibition, probably at LACMA, where the Bichelle collection, it's a great collection. It's, it's permanently on display. I know that UCLA also has a museum and uh, I think I may have seen some there as well. Um, as far as uh, where I first learned about them, I can't remember, but I definitely remember where I bought my first one and then that uh, triggered me to continue to learn more about them. And it's, uh, it's been a really fun journey. How many pieces do you have in your collection now? I think I have around 80 Netske and maybe 50 Indro and about 20 pipe cases. And what's your favorite piece? <laughs> that I'd have to think about. Well, one of them I showed earlier. Um, so it was the Indro where I was showing the compartments pulled apart so that you can see how the Indro was constructed. So that's definitely one of my favorites. And are you continuing to collect? Yes, I am. Do you are there are there contemporary Net, Netsuke masters that you go after or? That's, well, there are contemporary carvers or, or modern carvers. So there are people today who make Netsuke as an art form, and they make beautiful pieces. Um, some in the antique style, and others in their own style. Uh, personally, I tend to gravitate more towards the antique ones. Because I, I look at them as pieces of art, but also kind of as uh, historical artifacts. So maybe I'm a little bit different than some collectors in viewing them in that manner. So I, I tend to collect antique pieces. Well, David, uh, thank you so much. And I think that with the Impressions article on Netsuke later this year, Jasa is going to learn a lot more about Netsuke. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation. And I hope that you'll join us on March 14th for JASA's annual meeting and lecture with our two co-curators of Meiji Modern in conversation with Michelle Yun Maplethorpe, who is the Director of Global Programming at Asia Society New York and the Director of the Asia Society Museum in New York. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much, Allison. Good night, everyone.